Hey there, in this lecture we'll talk about the time period that Texas was its own republic from about 1836 until 1845 when it's finally annexed into the United States. We'll also talk about what life was like for early European settlers that come in, but we'll also talk about other marginalized groups or marginalized groups at the time, and those would be African Americans, women, and Tejanos. Um, so we'll go through that as we talk about on um, the challenges that Texas faced as its own state, or own republic, I'm sorry. Anyway, so um, what did Texas look like in 1836, right? It was it was still very underpopulated. It still had the issue of not attracting a lot of settlers there. Um, this is about the breakout. We know from our last lecture we talked about um, the number of Tejano to, um, to Anglos was uh, slowly dwindling. So there were more and more Anglos to every Texan uh, or to every Anglo that, was, uh, that arrived there. And uh, we also know that with Anglos, um, many Anglos brought slaves to the areas. Um, there were some indigenous tribes, although the indigenous groups are also depleting, uh, but we, there are some new indigenous groups, um, mo most specifically the Cherokee, who arrive around the 1820s as they're getting pushed out from Georgia, and more will come during the um, Indian Removal Act in 1830, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, regarding politics in uh, the Republic of Texas, um, there were two growing factions. Factions are just political parties, and uh, they basically sat on like two camps. Those that wanted and saw Texas, like this grandiose vision of Texas where they saw Texas expanding to the Pacific Ocean and saw Texas becoming its great own individual republic. People that supported that vision were people like Marabu Lamar, who will be the second president. And those that really just wanted to get into the United States as an own state, as their own state, was the kind of the other camp. And that was led by Sam Houston and people that supported his vision. Um, Sam Houston be the first president. He'll be elected in. Uh, actually, Austin ran against him, but he was incredibly popular, even though he lost popularity uh, towards, in the middle of the revolution, he actually gains popularity you know, with San Jacinto. Um, and so the way the Texas Constitution was written at that time, the first president could only serve two terms and couldn't rerun, and that's why he didn't run a second term. Um, and then after that, it was every three years. Uh, the last uh, you know, uh, president of the Republic of Texas was Dr. Anson Jones, and he served for a very short time because Texas is annexed in December of 1845. So what was Houston's term like when he became president? Well, he was part of the camp, and he's going to lead this, this school of thought in Texas at the time, that it's very important for Texas to be able to annex into the United States as soon as possible, and mainly because of the debt. But the United States is going to refuse, like three times before it'll finally accept. And the main reason, a couple, well, there was a couple of really big reasons. One reason was because they were worried about how, you know, their relations with Mexico. They didn't want Mexico to think that they had been involved in the Texas Revolution. Uh, and that's what Jackson primarily talked about, why he hesitated to allow them in. Um, and, you know, Mexico, as I mentioned, is not going to recognize Texas's independence at all. And they won't until they're kind of forced into it after the U.S.-Mexican War ended in 1848. However, um, the other really, really big reason for this was there was a major debate in the United States going on uh, that was growing and growing about getting rid of slavery. That was a movement that was happening in Europe, Great Britain, other European countries had already gotten rid of slavery. And so the American South was the only one kind of hanging on to that, okay? There was a series of treaties um, and negotiations that the North and the South jockeyed for during this time period. 1820, there was a Missouri Compromise and there was a constant battle of slave states and free states and they didn't want to disrupt that number. If they allowed Texas into the Union, it would come in as a slave state. And so of course U U.S. Southerners wanted Texas, but people in the North too, many of them didn't. And there's many people that were in the South that may have wanted it, but didn't want to like lead into a civil war, which is eventually gonna happen anyway. Okay, but anyway, um, so that's not the only thing that was happening during uh, Sam Houston's first term. He does seek to get recognition by foreign countries. Um, 
to recognize Texas. And again, people are hesitant to do this, or different countries are, because of the fact um, that it would anger Mexico. Um, he did try to have people from both factions represented in his first cabinet, in his first group of people that surrounded him. Um, he, he also creates the town of Houston, although it was just seen as like a muddy pit at the time, um, but he does move the capital um, there. Okay, so one of the conditions of Santa Ana's release um, after the end of the Mexican Revolution was that he promised to try to convince Mexico of this, um, of their independence, right? To recognize their independence. That was part of the private treaty uh, that they made with Santa Ana. Um, Andrew Jackson, who actually was in the last couple months of his presidency, uh, you know, uh, Santa Ana arrives in Washington, D.C. when Jackson's at the end of this presidency. He knows that Santa Ana can't really represent, like he can't make decisions on behalf of Mexico that it would have to go before the Mexican Congress. Um, but he is received very warmly. The people from the north are, you know, they're kind of wrapping their arms around Santa Ana going, oh, those, you know, slaveholders in, the, in Texas and blah, 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 and that's why it was fought. Uh, but either way, um, they offer him and they want him to bring to Mexico the United States to give Mexico three and a half million to buy Texas and North Mexico. Um, so they send Santa Ana back, Santa Ana goes back, but they also sent an envoy uh, from Andrew Jackson and the guy, like the, the, the uh, president of Mexico at the time of the Congress of Mexico, they wouldn't even see him. Okay, so they knew what the writing on the wall was. Um, and so they refused to, you know, even see him because they didn't recognize Texas as independence. Okay, so when Texas was forming and deciding how to form, it basically created um, the counties that were mainly the same boundaries that were already created in Spanish uh, impresario system and also by Mexico. Um, they set up a court system that had a Supreme Court that was really important to them. That's something they didn't have in Mexico. Um, they saw their boundary um, encroaching on what the United States saw as part of the Louisiana Purchase and Mexico claimed still theirs. And you can see from this picture, they claimed it all the way up to Wyoming um, and across into New Mexico, okay? So uh, the boundaries here will come a little bit later after the U.S.-Mexican War, which we'll talk about. Um, but it's important to note that that's the way they really saw them. Economically, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, Texas was really broke. The, the money was valueless. Um, they were importing more than they exported. And so they were an economic uh, sheer crisis, really. Um, on the next slide here, we've got a map that kind of shows you, like this is a primary source map, kind of shows you a lot of the same boundaries that they had before. Okay, so as I mentioned, Sam Houston is only gonna be president for um, two years. The next president was actually uh, Maribu Lamar, who was his vice president and was literally um, Sam Houston's nemesis. They were, they very much disliked each other. Um, during his inauguration, Lamar's inauguration, Sam Houston got really drunk and dressed up as George Washington and caused like a huge scene. And that really set the stage for their relationship afterwards. Um, it was, so the Republic of Texas presidential election was held in 1838. Um, by provision, like I mentioned in the Constitution, the term of office for the first president was limited to two years. Um, so Sam Houston was not eligible to run again. Um, because they didn't allow him to run the consecutive terms, he'll run in the next election, okay? A little bit of a biography about Lamar. He was a failed politician. He had tried to rise politically in Georgia and he didn't make that. He comes to Texas, much like many people who are looking for a fresh start. Um, he served in the Battle of San Jacinto. Um, he's nicknamed the poet president because he actually liked to write a lot of poetry and painted oils. Um, he was a major expansionist. He saw the United States, I'm sorry, the, Texas as um, growing from coast to coast. Um, he does set aside land for edu higher education. He found that important. So that's land that will later become the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M. But during Lamar's presidency, he's gonna send um, Texas into a huge amount of debt, uh, up to 8 million by the end of his presidency, okay? They started off at, at, at 1 million. Um, he sees all indigenous people as hostile, even the Cherokee, 
and he moves the capital, and this was a little dig to Houston, he moves the capital from Houston to Austin, okay? Um, now, recognizing Texas's independence, so this was first the brainchild of Sam Houston, or I'm sure a lot of other politicians at the time wanted that too. Um, he does, Lamar actually does send an envoy to Mexico to try to get them again to recognize his independence. He actually offers them $5 million of money that Texas didn't have, but Mexico refuses it anyway. But by 1840, um, France, Great Britain, Netherlands, they all recognized Texas's independence. However, because Texas was such a hot mess, uh, it was so unstable and it was in so much debt and there wasn't you know, much economically that could grow other than cattle industry, um, nobody would give loans to Texas, okay? Um, meanwhile, in Mexico, dot, 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 there was a war, a little skirmish between France and, and Mexico at the time, nicknamed the Pastry War, which allows Santa Ana to come back into power. And that's important because he's going to try to seek some retribution and payback to the Texans who embarrassed him so much during the Texas Revolution. Okay, so now we're back to talking about Lamar. Um, as I mentioned, he was an expansionist. He wanted Texas to expand, and he wrongfully thought that the people of New Mexico would want to, would be excited to find out that they're now part of this official new republic that Texas has saw, right? Um, he was wrong. He was very, very wrong. Um, so Lamar sends, uh, or asks for money from Congress to send this envoy to go to Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, and let him know, hey, guess what? You know, you're part of us. You're welcome. Um, he sends, so he wants to send the envoy. The Congress says, no, they don't have the money to fund an envoy, but he sends him anyway. It's an awful journey. And if you look at this map, they're basically going from Austin. They're going across this horrible area. Um, into Santa Fe. There's tons of, this is the area of Comancheria. There's tons of Comanche that they run into, but they show up in New Mexico and the governor's like, get out, right? And he actually sends troops to repel them, to keep them out. And uh, the Santa Fe, people in the Santa Fe expedition are caught by the New Mexico governor. They're taken prisoner and they're marched down to Mexico. And we'll talk about them uh, and what happens to that group of people here in just a minute. But it was a failed mission, and it also hashtag exposes how weak Texas really was. So the next presidency will go to Sam Houston. Sam Houston will serve a second term, and this time it will be for three years. Um, he sends expeditions around, to, in, particularly in South Texas, to try to draw in more loyalty to the government. There were many people at the time of the Texas Revolution that didn't want a complete break from Mexico. They just wanted the Constitution of 1824 reinstated. And so there's a lot of people, particularly Tejanos in the South, who are really upset about this, okay? Um, like I mentioned before, the debt had already reached $8 million. He only sees annexation as the solution. So he is consistently trying to, you know, reach out to the United States to try to ask again and again to be annexed into the United States. Um, he also tries to restore the peace. Now, Sam Houston did send raids um, against different Native American groups. He didn't see them all as peaceful, which they weren't. Um, and uh, so there were different, different events, especially when there were raids and there were settlers that were kidnapped, white settlers that were kidnapped, that Sam, uh, or Sam Houston did retaliate. But by 1844, he was trying to restore the peace and uh, passed a passage, a peace treaty in 1844 before the end of his, um, his term. Now, as I mentioned before, Mexican troops um, will invade Texas in retaliation for the Santa Fe expedition. And they actually occupy San Antonio for a little while, though they shortly leave after that. Um, and it further it kind of exposes, um, you know, the weakness that happened uh, that was present in Texas at the time. So Sam Houston actually orders the people of, of Austin to evacuate. He also orders the archives that Lamar had moved to Austin to be removed back to Houston. The people that had remained in Austin saw this as a slight, refused to give up the uh, the archives, there was a skirmish that happened between them, and this was known as the Archives War, and they had never left Austin ever since then. However, 
Um, in retaliation for the occupation that happened in San Antonio, Houston orders the Mir expedition, which goes down and actually they take cattle from people of Mexico, um, closer to Laredo. Mexico retaliates to this. Um, they, you know, when, when they tried to invade the town of Mir, um, they repel the effort and they capture people. Um, or they capture Texans. So the Texans are captured, uh, about 176 of them actually escape. They're recaptured by Mexican authorities and Santa Ana orders their death, okay? However, there were a lot of like different uh, emissaries and uh, people from other countries that were coming in saying, don't do that, that's gonna make things a lot worse. So he agrees to do this thing that's known as the black bean episode. We're in a jar and that's what this picture is depicting, like a scene from that. Um, 17 soldiers were going to be executed, um, and if they drew a black bean, they would be executed. So the 17 that drew black beans were executed. The other 159 um, lived to tell the story, but yeah, that's known as the black bean episode. Okay, moving away from that, let's talk about what was happening in Texas at the time and growth in the, in the Republic of Texas, because people were moving to Texas by this point. Um, the Panic of 1837, which was like a recession happening in, in the United States at the time, drew a lot of people, particularly from the South. Now, people couldn't get loans to start businesses in Texas if they came from the North because of all the Indian raids and the instability and the trouble with Mexico. And so the people that were coming into Texas were people that were slaveholders and um, didn't need to secure loans. The road itself was extremely arduous. They did have invented a steam engine about 1825. And uh, there was only a couple rivers, the Trinity and the Colorado, that would actually be able to you know, use a steamboat. The other ones were too shallow. But essentially, um, you know, Texas really made an effort. They created their own impresario system and made a real effort to try to draw people in. Um, they had about 250 million acres set aside for people to move in, and they gave essentially the same amount of land um, that they did under the Mexican impresario system. They also, to like add to the mix, right, to make it even more inviting, um, they threw in the Homestead Exemption Act, which essentially protected any kind of debtors um, from having their land seized. So if they were coming there for a fresh start, but then their debtors came after them, their lands were protected or mostly protected. And on top of that, they only needed um, to live there for three years and to cultivate in order to gain the title. So it was very enticing for a lot of people. Some of the people that come are from other countries besides the United States. Um, a lot of them were from Germany. It just so happened that in 1848, there was a failed German revolution. And so that drew a lot of German settlement into Texas at the time. They're known as the 48ers because they arrived in 1848. They established a lot of like the um, enclaves. Enclaves are like areas like a little Italy or Chinatown or places like that in which people congregate that are part of the same kind of culture and language. And so that's how a lot of the towns that are around us like Fredericksburg and New Braunfels really form. Another town that you might know, Casterville, was founded by a French baker. An Englishman named William Peter established Dallas in, um, in 1841. Um, and as these settlements come in, there's more and more pressure for people to become anglicized. Okay, we'll talk about how that, what that did to Tejanos that were already there. So what was life like for women in Texas at this time? Now they do lose autonomy more than they had before as things become more and more Anglo. They were expected to stay in their own private sphere. Um, they were able to run farms and businesses when their husbands were away. And there were, if you're comparing them, women in Texas to women in the United States and, and elsewhere as well, um, they did have more rights as regards to some things like divorce. There was actually a divorce act that allowed women in the United States, or I'm sorry, in Texas, to be able to divorce in cases of abuse and abandonment. Believe it or not, this was not prevalent in the United States. Um, and we'll talk more about women's rights and, and things like that a little later on. Um, but just understand that even with this, women still were very restricted. They couldn't get an education. They couldn't legally own, sell, or transfer their property without their husband's permission. And so, you know, life for women in Texas, a little better than the United States in, in some aspects, uh, but not great. Uh, by far the group that, um, the two groups that received the worst treatment are African-Americans and uh, in the indigenous groups. 
African Americans lose autonomy um, as Texas uh, becomes its own republic, and that is, of course, because slavery was permitted, specifically permitted. Uh, John Ford, he was a physician. This, I mean, this quote really got me when I read it. Slavery came to the Southern man authorized by the supreme law of the land. The assumption in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal was not intended to include African American race or a falsehood of, on its own face. So that should tell you basically the way that they thought. Now, one thing is that a lot of people think that you know everybody had like 50 or 60 slaves on every plantation. Only about 1.5 percent of all slave owners in Texas had large plantations, and that was pretty predominant in the South. Most um, slave owners had four or less, just a few that lived there. Um, so, the, but the majority of African Americans that lived in the United in in Texas at that time lived on larger plantations. There weren't very many that lived on small plantations. Um, now, there was a law in 1840 that said that uh, that Texas passed. It said that free blacks could not immigrate, and Texans and black Texans, free black Texans that lived in the United States. Um, or in Texas, I'm sorry, I keep on saying that, uh, actually had to leave within two years. Um, there are only a couple exceptions to that. One exception was a man named Samuel McCullough Jr. He actually fought in the Texas Revolution and appealed to Congress to get an exemption to be able to live in Texas, and he won that. He stays in Texas until 1893. Um, there were some people that were champions of the cause. One was a guy named Stephen Pearl Andrew, and essentially he was a Texas abolitionist, a lawyer. He actually went to England to try to petition to get um, funds to try to free the slaves in Texas, like buy their freedom. When his ploy is found out, he's mobbed by people in Texas and essentially driven out. Okay. Uh, regarding the Tejano experience, um, even Tejano elite's influence was beginning to decrease. Uh, Juan Seguin is eventually drawn out. He's actually accused of being a traitor and ends up leaving and, and going to Mexico and lived there for a long time. Um, lots of uh, ranches are raided, um, and Tejano ranches in, in South Texas. The ex-Anglo soldiers don't differentiate them between um, Mexicans and Tejanos. And there was an incident known as the Cordova Rebellion. Vincente Cordova was a former mayor of Nacogdoches. He supported Texas's um, revolution, but only in the sense that they wanted to restore the Mexican constitution in 1824. He didn't support its own independence and probably primarily for this reason that he felt that the Tanos would be overrun. So he actually, um, gathers a, a band of Tejanos and Cherokee who had lost their title and launches a major rebellion, which is quickly put down. Um, he, he, is, uh, he runs away, flees to Mexico, and is followed a year later by 100 other significant Tejano families. So um, Tejanos will begin to lose influence as Anglos pile more and more into Texas. Um, as I mentioned before, Life for indigenous people was very bad. Even Sam Houston, other than the Cherokee, had policies against indigenous people. Um, Sam Houston did make a treaty with the Cherokee that if they fought in the revolution, they would get land title and made a treaty with them, but that's revoked by Lamar. He forcibly removes them and they actually go on another almost trail of tears, not really a trail of tears, but they were forced out and they head up and, um, and the, then the Texas military catches up to them and and kills several of them, including their chief, Chief Bull. Um, and so, you know, they scatter and they're, you know, some went to Arkansas, some of them went to other areas of Texas where they felt that they could be safe. Um, the Comanche are gonna be a continued threat and they're going to be until the 1870s with Quanah Parker being the last one to fall. Um, but the band of, there is one group, the Penatacas, the most um, well-known group of Comanches, and they actually petitioned to, for a peace agreement with the United States, or I can say that, with Texas. They go to San Antonio to broker this peace. They're told to bring um, any white uh, any white captures that they had, and they brought one with them, and the person that they brought, she said, hey, there's more, and they said, hey, you need to bring more, and they said, this is the only one. A big skirmish breaks out, and um, there are 18 men, three women, and two uh, Comanche people are killed, called the massacre at the council house. 
um, they leave and they the Panitacos go and, and go to other groups in New Mexico and Colorado, other Comanche groups to tell them what had happened. Um, a pretty strong Buffalo commander, yes, his name was Buffalo Hump, that was his name. He leads a raid with 500 Comanche and, uh, and Kiawas who actually had made an alliance with the Comanches. They took hundreds of thousands of you know worth of goods, 3,000 horses, which was wealth to Comanches. And it cost the, the Texas government another two and a half million to try to stop these raids, okay? But luckily for Texas, um, they finally do get annexation. Texas, uh, Houston actually strategically reaches out to other countries, uh, Great Britain in particular, to try to get them to give them annexation. His tactic works. Um, John Tyler, who was US president at the time, starts a whole uh, propaganda campaign to say, hey, the British are trying to take Texas, let's get that. So in June of 1844, it again goes before the Senate and they turn it down again, okay? But the final tip, of Texas's annexation was the election of uh, James Polk. He campaigns and wins a landslide on the policy of annexation, not just for Texas, but also for Oregon at the time to satisfy people of the North. So seeing this as a sign that this was what the American people wanted, um, Texas renewed its annexation in March of 1845. And by December of 1845, they become the 29th state of the United States. So in our next lecture, we'll talk about how that leads to the Mexican-American War, which arguably is another tipping stone that will lead to the American Civil War.